Okay, so um, we'll take a minute and set our motivation. Taya So um, before we jump into the meditation section, um, did you have any feedback or any thoughts about um, the five Buddha families exercise that we did? Was it um, interesting? Did, you, did it make you kind of self-reflect in a useful way? Did you show it to your family and say, okay, we're going to do a quiz? <laughs> I have to say that um, I didn't find myself in no one of the sentences. It's like every sentence was too much or too little. Or... So I couldn't find, yeah, this is me. Yeah, okay. I know myself like this. It's... That's why I didn't answer and that's why... And I don't even understand the families, okay? I don't have... Uh... Sorry. <laughs> in essence, although I would love, but maybe it's a function of investing and, and I'm not investing as deep enough. Of course, I can take it on me. But well, it's an invitation, right? It's an invitation. It's not a, um, it's not a dictation. It's not a mandate. It's an invitation to explore. So I think, I think a lot of times this group thinks that I'm talking about many things when I'm talking about one thing many ways. I, I think that sometimes then you think, oh my God, your English is so complicated. No, it's, I'm just saying the same thing again and again, hoping that one of them will land. Yeah, so similarly in the quiz, it looks like, oh, so many words, they're saying the same thing. <laughs> just look, is any one of them resonate? You know, so it's, it's an invitation for self-reflection the conclusion doesn't really matter. The conclusion doesn't matter so much. It's, it's very important to know yourself. Otherwise, you don't know why you do progress and you don't know why you don't progress. You know, so self-awareness is the key to all transformation from a Buddhist perspective. You have to know yourself while at the same time knowing that that self changes constantly, is, it, is influenced by a million different things, and there's no core essence. So it sounds like a paradox or a contradiction to say, know yourself. But so, you know, you don't have to take on board any of these frameworks, right? The sutra dispositions or the tantra dispositions, but the premise of a disposition is worth sitting with. How am I on a good day? How am I on a bad day? Um, and if you see no parallel between your strengths and your weaknesses, that's a really interesting place to dig into. Because so often our strengths and our weaknesses are parallel qualities energetically. You know, they're the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. You know, if you think of your um, kids or your husband or your best friends, it's so easy to see that the thing that I love about you is also the thing that is the most annoying you know, depending on the day. You know, I love that you're well organized and efficient and know what you're doing. And I hate that you're so bossy and so critical and so controlling. It's the same trait, isn't it? It's the two sides of the same trait, you know, etc. 
So you don't have to use this framework. It's completely fine not to, but um, it is important to examine your own disposition or your resistance to examining your own disposition. <laughs> right? That's, it's important because also it's hard to know why you have affinity and resonance and connection with some of your patients and why some of them you just don't get each other and there's not a synchronization. It can seem like there's something wrong with you or something wrong with them instead of just, oh, they're operating from this whole other framework. So to communicate with them, I need to find where that exists within my own framework because it's not as dominant for me as it is for them. So I need to be able to find all five Buddha families within myself and to know which one is the most dominant one because then it'll help me communicate with others that are other, you know, and it'll help me also have a richer experience of being able to tap into the strengths of all five. So, you know, approach it however you want. It's your own life, it's your own practice, but um, uh, I will stick to the premise that self-awareness is the key to all transformation and that acknowledging your own disposition is very important in communicating to other people. I have to remind you that we are doing it on a regular basis, four times a week, besides in supervision, so it's another hour and... We do it to ourselves all the time because that's uh, almost a, a habit. That I hope so. Stuck yeah. so <laughs> hard. Stuck so hard. So sometimes it's hard to lose it even. Mm. So we are in it, but it depends on the right phrasing or the phrasing that touches the heart, you know. Sure, yeah, no, and you can just strike out the whole semester. Don't worry, a new topic is coming. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, it's that you have lots of frameworks already. Sometimes we get stuck in what we know. Here's a whole different way. It's a completely different framework. Let's just play with it, make the mind flexible, prevent Alzheimer's, prevent dementia. Let's just be flexible and see, what about this? And then you can take it or leave it. You know. Um, so as I've said many times, your approach to study is as important as what you study, you know? So if you come in kind of with, I already know that, or, or I already have a way that works for me, what is the point in learning anything? Why are you even here? You know, that's a really important question for us because we all fall into, I already know that, or I already have a way to look at that. You know, it happens to me in class with, um, when teachers are teaching a topic that I've heard many times, say it's something like compassion or something. And I think, oh my God, yeah, I get it. I'm on board. Compassion is good. Two thumbs up. I get it. And then I sit with, why am I resisting this conversation? It's not like I've integrated compassion perfectly. Every time I hear it is, it can be fresh and it can go deeper. Why won't I let it go deeper today? Because some days I do and I love it, even though I've heard it a million times. So um, I guess the invitation I'm offering here is to examine our, our approach to study as much as the content. Yeah, as much as the content is really important. Because at the end of the day, after seven years, I'm guessing that there are only going to be a few topics for some of you that you actually bring into your daily life and bring into your practice. Um, some of you will take on the whole Buddhist path. Some of you might even become Buddhist, but I'm guessing the vast majority of you will stay whatever you are and just use some elements like some mindfulness and some techniques, and that's completely fine. But if you know how you are as a student, that self-awareness is so enriching for developing pathways of empathy with people. You know, so it's a process of self-awareness and self-reflection and getting the human condition. And if you knew everything about humanity already, you probably wouldn't have decided to take a seven year course. <laughs> All right. So well done being up for it. I'm always impressed when grownups decide to go back to school. I think it's very brave and uh, shows great um, courage. Yeah. I wanted to ask about um, what you said about this position. What do you mean exactly? Is it um, because it, you, what you're saying, this position is maybe is a thing that uh, an area that doesn't change in the mind? Is it's it more like it changes, but it's more like your common trend. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like your like personality type, right? But it's, it's more like it's not permanent. It's not definite. It's not solid. But we all do have like a, a go-to strength and a go-to affliction 
when we're, you know, in the right conditions. And then all of the other ones happen as well, of course. We have all of the everything, you know, it depends on conditions. But from beginningless time until now, we've accumulated kind of habit patterns that have kind of planted us into a family in a way. And I, I think that we feel it when we're with people of our tribe, you know, or people of our family where, excuse me, where communication is very easy. You can take shortcuts with your communication. You just get each other. And it's probably because you're of a similar, quote, family, because your mind has trended a certain way or has developed similar habit tendencies. Um, and then people that you just don't get, they've developed different habits. So I think it helps you not, I guess, make a qualitative difference. You know, you think, okay, all of these are equal in power, equal in mistakes, equal in wisdom. They're all equal, but they are a bit different. And seeing myself within that is, is useful, but none of it is permanent. So think of it as trends, I guess, more than um, anything too concrete. This is the trend my mind has gone through. And... Uh, have you ever done like a Myers-Briggs personality test? <laughs> right? They used to be all the rage, right? Back in the 90s, 80s, yeah. And uh, I remember I took, I took them many times as a young person and um, I was always the same one. I'll out myself, I was an INFP. Um, but uh, then as years went by and I practiced Buddhism, it actually, the P changed to a J. And, um, you know, did my personality fundamentally change? How could it change if I was a core, inherent, yada, yada? But we all know that we change over time given different conditions and where our mind is at at the point of self-reflection too. So certainly I've trended a certain way the whole life, but then there's been certain aspects that have adjusted and tweaked over time. Yeah, disposition. Uh, yeah. Can you say that uh, in light enlightened people uh, don't have a personality or disposition like uh, Talia said. They are, uh, their mind can, can change to uh, in every moment and they don't have disposition. Yeah, it's more like, yeah, like they have all of them. They have all of them completely integrated, perfected, and only the wisdom side, not the neurotic side. But because they have all of them, they're able to understand the needs of the neuroses of each side. You know, so that, that's why they talk about the Buddha's manifesting in certain ways. Sometimes the Buddha will show an appearance of anger or show an appearance of lust or show an appearance of peace, even though they're completely integrated and without afflictions. But in order to, you know, for lack of a better word, mirror or resonate with the person in front of them, they meet them where they are and then try and lift them together to the next stage. Um, and it doesn't mean at all that the Buddha is of that disposition. It just means that they are show, presenting that. So the Buddhas, um, they do fall into the categories of the five Buddha families. All the Buddhas do fall into one of those five categories. But in the background, we always know that that's what they're emphasizing. It's not who they are. So maybe when they were a bodhisattva, when they were, an or, when they were a completely ordinary being on the path before any realizations, they were of that Buddha family. And as their developmental process continued, they stayed with that trend. They became completely enlightened and could embody any and all. But still there is that kind of like dominant resonance which means that their karmic connection is more easily flowing with people of that type. Yeah. So you see, um, you'll be able to tell which Buddha family a Buddha belongs to based on who is at the crown of their head in the practice sadhana. So um, like Aryatara, who's, you know, she's green in color, one face, two arms, foot out. If you were to read the full description of her, you would see that she has Amitabha in her hair knot, meaning she has a little red Buddha perched at the top, meaning that she belongs to the Lotus family. She transforms attachment into discernment. You know, so, so it's, in, it's like, you know, you have to kind of look for what's in their crown knot and sometimes the artists don't draw it in. They just draw a little golden knob, but it's to indicate all of them do belong to a Buddha family despite encompassing all of them. Yeah. 
I mean, you guys have this happening with referrals, I'm guessing a lot. There's sometimes a patient where you're a good person, they're a good person, but it's just not working. And you know that they will work with your colleague much better. And so you're like, why don't you try them? And it's nobody's fault. It's just a disposition thing. No, I'm guessing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's not. Uh, first of all, I wanted to the uh, explanation about the Buddha ears it was very interesting. And I wanted to say something totally unconnected. But yesterday I was looking at uh, uh, my son is a freak of Japanese and Japanese movies. And so we're looking at this uh, Japanese movie about a princess. I don't remember its name. And first of all, I was totally looking at their ears and the size of their earrings. But then there was something very interesting. There was a God there and the God lost his head. And then from being a God of, I don't know if you know the movie, but from being a God of a life and death of goodness and badness, he became a God only of death. And I thought how it's interesting. Uh, I could understand that goodness lies in the head, in the mind and not in the heart. I thought how different it is. So I thought, yeah. okay, I learned something. Because <laughs> I think in our culture, every, everything good is about our heart. Yeah. Then I realized the Buddha nature that it lies in the head, in the mind. So <laughs> it was very interesting. So I wanted to say something sink in. <laughs> that is interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, the, the mind uses the brain, doesn't it? It uses the brain. It's not the brain, but it uses the brain. Um, I mean, the it speed of this. It resonates with this area. Like, yeah, exactly. With our thinking, with our, yeah. So it was very nice. There, um, yeah, it's really interesting. And what all of that signifies. There's a story of a a fully ordained nun um, named Bhikshuni Lakshmi, who had leprosy and uh, she cured herself of leprosy by doing Chenrezig practice. And uh, the villagers didn't believe that she was a pure practitioner. She thought they, they were, you know, doing all the normal things they do to women who they're threatened by and calling her a prostitute and calling her this and calling her that. And so in order to prove to them that she had realizations, she flew up into the sky and she said, if I'm um, not enlightened, if I cut off my head, then I'll die. And she cut off her head and it went flying around and then it came back and reattached. And she was like, see? Anyway, <laughs> so we have stories like that too. <laughs> Big Shuli Lakshmi, she's great. Okay, so random asides. <laughs> Very good, excellent. Um, all right, so we're gonna look at Lam Yeshi's book and um, go ahead and start on page six. Do you guys see? Page six, or else in your own books. So this book was um, written for a five-day meditation course, and um, some of the people were brand new, and some of them had been practicing with him for a while. And I've mentioned it before, but you know, Lama Yeshi did the very unique thing of teaching very advanced topics to complete beginners um, and very advanced techniques in a very simplified way. Um, in a way, acknowledging that Western people are often pretty well educated. And so dropping something advanced right into their laps sometimes works out just fine. So um, it, here it says, um, the second paragraph down, pure motivation is a function of the wise and open mind which is the total opposite of the narrow, psychologically defiled, obsessed mind that is overly concerned for one's own benefit and welfare. Completely donating your life to others has great effect on your internal world. So he's saying, when you, when you meditate, set your motivation. What is a pure motivation? Something like this. So you don't have to call it bodhicitta, but something like this. So I think we're pretty, clear on motivation in terms of your meditation practice. But before we go into the next section, did you want to explore anything about setting your motivation or cultivating your motivation? Is it a premise that works for you or does it feel weird? Hmm. 
For me, it talks to me. There is a, a paragraph in Tich Nathan book that I uh, like it so much uh, to say it for myself when I meditated. That uh, he said that remember that when you are meditate, even if you are happy or you feel good for a moment, it's not just for yourself. It's for all the world. You are not sitting just for yourself, even in the moment you are sitting. Yep. And, and it brings text. It's beautiful, isn't it? And it brings more life to your own practice, I think, too. You know, the, the selfish mind says, just look after yourself, but it actually doesn't help the self as much to think that way. If you're sitting for all sentient beings, it's easier to stick with it. You know, and so when it's good, you share it. But when it's negative, you think in this whole neighborhood right now, I might be the only person meditating. I might be the only person in the whole me- in the whole neighborhood who is trying to connect with clarity and awareness and trying to spread peace in this intentional way. And I know that if someone in the neighborhood is having a terrible argument, if there's a domestic violence situation, if there's some, I don't know, aggressive maintenance, if there's something like that, it has an effect on the whole neighborhood. How can I think that I don't have an effect on the whole neighborhood when I meditate on peace? You know, even just the breath, just simple the breath, trying to be one less agitated person in this world, trying to radiate some clarity and peace, it has a huge impact. And so when you remember that, then you think, all right, all right, all right, stay focused. But if it's just for you, you're like, nah, snack, I'll have a snack, <laughs> cup of tea, <laughs> you know. In the past, I used to be in a meditation that the, who, who, the one who guided the, the meditation, uh, every time when he finished, he read, he read to us this paragraph from, from Tich Nathan. Oh, beautiful. Powerful. Yes. And it's a, it's a good technique, too, if you do find a paragraph somewhere that really sticks with you to, you know, print it out, write it out, have it with your meditation. Because if you have a routine, that also helps. So, you know, once you find something that really strikes a chord with you, um, use it. Continuing on, um, I'm going to scroll down and um, we're going to go to page eight, meditation on the breath. <clears throat> and so... Meditation is done by the mind, therefore your mind should be with you in the present, not obscured with other time, place, person, or some other objects. The method we use to bring attention to the here and now is concentration on the breath, focusing on how your breath moves through your nervous system. Now, this is how we always start, you know, whether we're doing single pointed meditation or analytical meditation, the breath is either a preliminary or it's its own practice. But what it does is start to steady the surface distractions so they have time to settle down. There, I'm sure there are days when you can't even meditate on the breath. Yeah, there are days when it's just too busy, it's too stirred up, or you're too tired, and even the breath is too much. Or you can stay with it for 10 seconds and then your mind is just off racing and planning or obsessing about mistakes or whatever it is that your mind gets up to. And so Lamiyashi then introduces what's called the nine round meditation practice, which is actually kind of related to highest yoga tantra, but he just introduces it as here's a good way to get yourself refreshed. And so it sounds really simple, but it actually has many layers of meaning. And what you're doing is you're manipulating your breath a little bit to get yourself to calm down enough to do the rest of the meditation. So it can be seen as a preliminary or it can be its own practice. But basically what you're doing is alternating your nostrils. Okay, and so if you see down towards the bottom of the page, it says, um, I've highlighted it in green. If you are unfamiliar with the following meditation, you might find it easier to concentrate by oscillating the nostril you're focusing on with your index finger. This is your index finger. Okay. So as you breathe out through your left nostril, you use your finger to block the right. Yeah, so you can make a little fist and put it under your armpit like this, and then go and just block a nostril. And if it feels too weird to do that, you can just visualize it. You don't have to touch your nose. You can just think that that's happening, but it can actually help at least in the beginning. And what you do is you breathe in through your left, and then you breathe out 
through your right. Yeah, in through the left, out through the right. And you do that three times. And what you do at the same time is you can visualize the three main channels within the body. And I can send you a picture of the channels, but basically your three main channels, the center one starts here between your eyebrows and it goes all, it goes all the way down, all the way down, all the way down um, to about four finger widths below your belly button. And then the side channels go um, open at the two nostrils and they go up and over and then down on either side and then they hook in to the central channel like this. Yeah, like a little W. I don't know if you can see the tiny video, but they hook in. And so when you're meditating, you visualize that as you're breathing in, you're pushing out all of the kind of like contaminated stressed air and it comes out the other nostril. So you're breathing in clean air and breathing out anything that's kind of toxic, stressful, etc. It's a yeah, little so different yeah. from Tonglen. It in is, Tonglen. it is, yeah. We are doing although, that. although you can do Tonglen with this visualization. So yeah. there are some, yeah, you can do Tonglen with this visualization. But this visualization is really just for you with the motivation for others. You're not um, directly thinking to take on the negativities of others. You're thinking of to clear your own system so it settles down enough for you to practice. So you start by just in good air, out bad air, your own, <laughs> your own. And um, when you breathe in, it's, it's different than normal breathing meditation because normal breathing, breathing meditation, you're trying to not control your breathing. You're trying to just let it be natural. And in the beginning, it's, you know, whatever your breath is normally. If you're anxious, it's kind of up here. If you're relaxed, it's more low. You know, it's doing what it's doing. And as you focus on it, sometimes it settles, but you're not trying to control it too much or at all. In this meditation, you are trying to control it. And you're breathing in very slowly and breathing out very slowly. And you do three rounds. Um, and then you repeat the procedure in the reverse way. So on the top of page nine. So then you block one, breathe in. Imagine it's cleaning the whole side channel and then pushing out all the stress of the other channel. And I'll, I'll send you the nine round breathing meditation um, after this class um, right away. I've got it on a video somewhere from some time. So if you want to experiment with it, or you can just read this section from Lama Yeshi. Um, so you do that three times. And, you know, Lama Yeshi says, while doing this, sit up straight. It's important to sit up straight so that the channels aren't constricted. If you have back problems or you really can't sit up straight, it's okay to lie down. Just lie down in a way that you're not gonna fall asleep, okay? So, but straight back is important always, but it's particularly important for this meditation. And it keeps your, as he says, your nervous system straight. So when you inhale, feel that the air completely fills your whole body. And when you exhale, feel that it completely leaves. Yeah, and try not to think too much conceptually that you're doing a breathing exercise. Just try and do the practice. And then um, you can do it through both. Um, I don't know if he describes it here or not, but you breathe in through both nostrils. Imagine that it clears, that you're pushing out through both sides. And then you imagine that you're breathing out through the central channel, even though you don't have a third nostril. So you imagine that all of the um, central channel congested stressed air is leaving between your eyebrows and then dissolving into space. Yeah, so even though you don't have a third opening here, you imagine it's you breathe in through both and then push out through the center like that. Okay, so it's called nine rounds because you do three, three, three. Yeah. Does it make sense? And, and what is the deeper meaning? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> one level, <laughs> one level of the deeper meaning is um, with the right side, you're clearing out anger energy. And with the left side, you're clearing out attachment energy. And in the middle, you're clearing out ignorance energy. That's one level deeper. 
and there are more, <laughs> and there are more. But um, that's a good place to start. So you can think that conceptually if you want to, or you can just do it and try not to think in words too much. Just be with the physical experience of it and be with the visual of the three channels. You know, just try and be with it. And it sounds complicated the first time you hear it, but really you're just, you know, three, 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 you know, slowly, you know, not thinking too hard, not trying to push anything, but you are just getting grounded. Yeah. Um, Sometimes if you have something as basic as like allergies or a sinus infection or something happening, if you do this meditation, it actually can really ease headaches as well. Um, I find it really useful if I'm getting a bit of a headache, a tension headache or a migraine or something like that. If I do nine round breathing, it sometimes can interrupt a headache. Um, so it can be quite useful even just physiologically. And if you do this nine rounds and you're not feeling centered yet, then you just do it again. Yeah, just do it again, nice and slow, nice and slow. And once you're starting to feel, you know, okay, I'm here now. When you're feeling I'm here now, then you can move on to the next stages of the meditation. Yeah, so you can focus then just on the breath coming and going. And then as we've described before, then you can release, focus on the breath, and try to just be with bare observation of the thoughts. Yeah, so bare observation of the thoughts is something that is very useful and is not the end point of this meditation, but it can be its own meditation, especially on a really stressful day. If you can just watch your thoughts and consciously not believe them or disbelieve them, if you can try not to give them a narration or give them some sort of judgment, you know, if you're not pulling some towards you and pushing some away, if you can just be with watching, it can be very helpful. So it can be its own meditation, but in this meditation, moving towards Mahamudra meditation, it's still just one step. So you've let go of meditation on the breath and now you're just watching your thoughts. And when you start to kind of fall into one or get lost in one, you just gently disengage. So if you think of your thoughts like a train running by and your awareness could hook into one train car and get pulled along, you kind of like shake off the hook and come back to center. Whatever visual would work for you. But you just really consciously don't let yourself get sucked in to your own inner narrative. Yeah without pushing it away. So it's that line between acceptance and suppression. You're not suppressing and you're not clinging. That level of the meditation, and we've done this quite a few times, how do you go with that level of meditation? Do you, do you understand how that works? Do you have obstacles that happen with that? Um, is it something that you're able to do to watch your thoughts without jumping into your thoughts? on a good day, occasionally. <laughs> can you feel that there is a different part of the mind that can watch as opposed to another part of the mind that is talking or expressing or moving? That there's at the beginning, else? at the beginning, I am, uh, I, when I try to do it, it's uh, more easily to, to, um, uh, release the um, the thought, but after a while, I find myself in the. Um, um, it takes more time me to find out that I'm in the 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 thought, mm. and uh, and then of course I release it. But um, at the beginning, it's more uh, easily. It, mm. It's more easy. That's interesting, yeah. So maybe in the beginning we keep short enough sessions that we don't lose clarity and then just gradually, you know, a bit like physical exercise, you, you do it while you feel active and engaged with it, but if it yeah. starts to feel painful, it's too much. You know, it's not like it's painful for us to meditate, but it can yeah. get a little bit stale or something. Yeah, the, the, the motivation is uh, stronger in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's quite true. So when we're in a group, we can do a half an hour together because we're kind of holding each other. 
yeah. but when you're by yourself, I wouldn't recommend to do a full half hour. I would do much shorter than that when you're by yourself. Yeah. So um, we rely on the group um, to kind of build our skill set, and then when we go home, we wind up doing a, a smaller version of the same thing. And it's kind of like retreats and group practice is our training ground to learn how to do it. And then when we do it, we do a simpler version and a shorter version. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when you're watching the thoughts and not engaging with the thoughts, it's not like all thoughts have words. You know, some, some thoughts are just kind of emotions. Some people get colors and shapes and images. Some people get a song stuck in their head. You know, don't think that I, when I say thoughts that I mean only words, because it can be lots of different kinds of conception. It's just training in not believing everything you think or not investing significance in everything you think. We think any number of things. Some of it's, sometimes it's useful to examine the content and sometimes it's useful to train in not examining the content. So both are useful techniques, right? But here we're training in not examining the content, just observing it. So maybe you do that for just five minutes, maybe just five minutes of that, and then see if you can release into being with the watcher. Yeah, there is what has been watched and try not to invest in it. And now you're trying to focus in on that part of the mind that holds everything or carries everything or is above everything, because of course, none of it is physical. So however you frame it, just frame it the way that works for you. But it's, it's something other than the movement. Yeah, the part of the mind that is other than movement. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, uh, uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, Sangay Kadro uh, offered us uh, to count our breath. During the one In my Zoom, everyone now freeze. So, oh. I don't <laughs> so you come to your breath when? When? <laughs> But I remember that she offered us to count our breath. At what point? At what point? We are going after our thought. Mm. To kind of like come to an anchor. Yes. Yeah. I found a book, How to Meditate, a very useful, the practical guide. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic. Um, and it's very much related to Lama Yeshi's style of teaching. Obviously, Lama Yeshi was one of her teachers. Um, and she knew Lama Yeshi during his life. And so, yeah, How to Meditate is a fantastic resource. Um, what I'm talking about is a step, the next step after. So, of course, come back to your breath when you get distracted is an excellent rule. That's just a good rule generally. Whenever you get distracted, come back to your breath. But sometimes the breath is not the object of your meditation. You know, so when the breath is not the object of your meditation, if you really are very, very distracted, you might need it to ground you because it's physical. But if you're just distracted, you fell into your thoughts, then just come back to pulling back into the main mind or the spacious clarity of the main mind. Now, it's not as if you stop having thoughts. It's just the, what's emphasized is not the watching of them, but the watcher who can. Yeah, so if it's like, you know, uh, the light flowing through pictures in a movie, yeah, you know, the films going by and the pictures going through the movie, you can be watching the movie or you can turn around and look at the light. Do you know what I mean? So normally we're not just watching the movie, we're believing the movie of our mind. You know, we see the movement and the drama and the pictures and we believe when the heroine is successful and we believe when they fail and we laugh and we cry and we believe the whole drama of the movie. That's how we live. When we're doing this meditation, you try to watch the movie of your life with objectivity. Like if you were watching a movie that was entertaining but you weren't too invested in or you were watching a movie next to your best friend who you hadn't seen in a long time, and you're like, isn't that one actor in that other thing that I saw? You know, so you're like aware, you're enjoying it, but you're not like falling into the movie. Do you know what I mean? When you have some space, you can still eat popcorn, right? Um, so that's the next step. 
then the next step after that is you're not even watching the movie, you're turning around and looking at the light going through all the moving pictures. Yeah, so that's like kind of these stages. First, stop believing the drama, just watch the drama, <laughs> then turn around and look at what is even behind that. And stay there. I, I had for moments, I don't know if it's really, but I had like a feeling that there's some space or even like a distance. I don't know how to describe it, but then sometimes it even feels like the space or the distance is a thought. <laughs> I don't know how. Yeah. But it's like um, that, it, that I get sucked into that, into that space. I can see the thoughts in the distance, but it's only for a moment. But then I feel like I'm something in the space happens that doesn't, mm. I don't know if I'm explaining. Yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. And it's like, it's, it's very difficult to merge your focus with your focal object without losing mindfulness, you know? So it's like a good breathing meditation, for example, it's as if you've merged with the breath. You're not thinking, I will meditate on the breath. I will meditate on the breath. You're not thinking that, right? You're watching the breath. And then it's as if you merge your focus with the breathing process. But sometimes you can do that in such a way that it gets an edge of dullness to it you know, or it gets an edge of fog or something not clear and aware about it. So, you know, the meditation should be bright and fresh and clear enough that you can um, be flexible and shift and adjust when shifting and adjusting needs to happen. And sometimes it doesn't need to happen, but you're like ready to, you know? You know, like, can you picture like a, a boxer who's like stopped, but they're like ready? You know, they're ready. <laughs> they might be completely still, but everything is activated, you know? Anyway, whatever analogy works for you. Yeah, <laughs> whatever analogy works for you. So just, just gradually, and it does need to be kind of short sessions for a while. So, you know, breath, thoughts, thinker, you know? If you can do breath, thoughts, thinker, when you're in the thinker or um, in the observer or in the holder, whatever you want to call it, if you get good at that, then you can bring in, who is that, <laughs> right? But you can't be like, who is that until you've kind of connected with that, yeah? So where we're going is then who is that? But that takes some time. So right now we're just kind of getting used to the, the mechanisms of connecting with clarity of the mind. So we've done it enough times, I think that we can talk about it a bit more and you have some experience of it to, to rely back on. Um, this, this text actually has a lot of really good things to do if, you're, if you just can't connect to clarity. It's just not working and um, different kind of ways to dispel obstacles. So I'm going to um, go into some of those that Lami as she talks about. So in chapter two, um, techniques for the meditation session and the break, there's a section on page 15 that says the wandering mind. So on page 15, the wandering mind. <laughs> so as Rahali said, and as SK says, um, Lama Yeshi says, if your mind gets distracted by external objects, focus on your breath, obviously. Breathe in deeply and completely through your nose. But now we're adding a new technique, which is, um, again, very related to highest yoga tantra without any of the context for it and without any of the reasons behind it other than getting the mind to be clear. So know that this will come up later as you become more advanced in your practice, but this in and of itself is also just quite useful by itself, divorced from context. So you breathe in deeply and completely through your nose, then you bring your breath energy all the way down below your stomach, yeah, to your navel. Then you push down gently with your diaphragm, you know, that muscle. So you're kind of pushing the breath down, you know, pushing it down. And you tighten the muscles around your sex chakra, so like your pelvic floor, or, you know, down there, you sort of tighten it. And you're, so then you draw the energy up from below and the energy that you have pushed down from above to the point about four fingers width below your navel and then hold your breath. So it's kind of like you're squishing the breath. Yeah, you're, you're squishing it down here, down quite low. 
and just hold it there for a minute. Now you don't want to hold it so long that you get like panicked or uncomfortable, but it's not just a holding your breath up here. Like if someone said, hold your breath, you would hold it up here. Probably you're, you're consciously squishing it down and pulling it up. Yeah. Up from below, up from below and push down from above squish. Make sense ish. Maybe in yoga classes, you do this sometimes. And then when you hold your breath, you touch that point with your finger to bring your mind's attention to that. So just kind of like your belly, your lower belly, you just kind of go boop, right? <laughs> and just pop your own little belly. Basically, anywhere you touch in your body, your mind's attention goes to that, doesn't it? So you're not thinking of your right ear, but if you pull your right ear, now you're thinking of it. So if you, t if you just place your finger or your hand on your lower stomach where you're squishing the air, it brings your mind's attention there. It was already kind of concentrated there just because of the practice of holding the breath there, but adding the hand can kind of help bring more focus to it. So then you feel a joyful sensation there, just kind of blissful energy, and your mind automatically focuses on that point, and you just concentrate there just for a few seconds. Just a few seconds. When you do this meditation, hold your breath for as long as is comfortable, and then you exhale naturally, slowly, and completely, but you leave your mind on that concentrated feeling. So this is how you know how long to hold your breath. If you've held your breath so long that exhaling is like, bah, then you held it too long. So you just hold your breath long enough that you're starting to feel some sort of like tingle, blissful something, and then just really gradually breathe out. Let all of the air out. And then when you breathe in again, it's not a big, <gasps> not like that. It's just a, you're, you know, really slow down your breath and just abide in the concentration that can kind of happen naturally from having done that breath work. So if you do this breathing exercise, your mind just kind of naturally focuses back in. And it honestly only takes a few seconds to do this little practice, but it's a really good antidote for the wandering mind. So you can do it a couple times if you need to. Um, you know, you can do it once. It's really um, up to you. But uh, as Lamia, as she says here, unify your mind with bliss. Let your mind sink into that feeling. Don't feel separate from it by thinking, I'm feeling blissful. <laughs> right? Try not to overthink it. Just be with it. So that's the antidote to the wandering mind. You might have done something like this in yoga classes. It's uh, like vase breathing. It's similar to vase breathing or it's going in that direction. So instead of addressing distraction using your mind, you're addressing distraction using your body. So, so the breath uh, has to be very slowly. Yes. I don't breathe very slowly. But you could make yourself if you wanted to, right? So it's a practicing. Yeah, okay. it's a practicing. So normally you don't do anything to your breath. You just watch it right? Normally when you're meditating, uh, but here you're trying to control it. Yeah. I'm sorry for the question, but, um, um, how, how many, um, seconds every breath have to be? It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, it would go a little something like this. Ready? <laughs> it would go. Maybe 10. Yeah, done. And then you feel clearer? I feel clearer. Maybe I'll do it another time. You do it again. Yeah, oh, now I'm good. Okay, off we go. You know, so it doesn't have to be complicated. I know there's a lot of words to explain it, but it's, it's really not complicated at all. Um, so breathing in very, very slowly, while at the same time, um, engaging the muscles of your diaphragm and your pelvic floor you know so you, those lower muscles are engaged as well as your lungs engaged and you're just squashing the air lower than you normally would if you were holding your breath so if you were swimming and holding your breath you hold it in a different place than you do in this meditation in this meditation you try to hold it lower does that make sense it's a bit uh, activating the chi point or the chakra yep. of the sex or the libido or whatever. 
It's, it's more the navel chakra, but they, they're related. Yeah. Those, those two lower ones, they get engaged, but without any kind of content. Yeah. You don't want to bring any kind of sexual content at all. It's just the raw physicality of waking yourself up. Yeah. So don't get weird, please. Nobody get weird. Um, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, people in yoga classes and Pilates classes are forever strengthening their pelvic floor. You know, lots of women do it after they've had babies. You know, it's just an exercise, um, you know. Yeah, but definitely it engages the chakras and it engages the chi. That's part of why it wakes you up. So it can be really useful, um, really useful. Um, yeah, other questions? So, I mean, if you've done other kind of natural medicine, natural therapies, it, it, there's a lot of connection to it for sure, just as you were saying, there's a relationship. Eastern medicine has a, a generally pervasive idea about the inner energy system and the chi movement and the chakras. There's a kind of a generally accepted system that pervades. Um, all right, so then there's another technique. Okay, so on page 17, um, the previous one was about the wandering mind. This one is about the dull mind. So um, if your mind gets sluggish or sleepy, Try to focus on the light energy just below your navel. Uh, visualize it getting clearer and clearer, brighter and more radiant. Your foggy mind will disappear. The view of the foggy, sluggish mind tends to be dark. When you visualize light, the sluggish mind automatically disappears. This is not just some hallucination. There is already electric light energy within your body. When the air energy pushed down from above mingles with the energy pulled up from below, that electric light is activated. Okay, so to say electric is a very Lamayeshi way of framing things, you know. Um, it's not like you literally have, you know, plugged into a socket. But when you first do this initial practice of the breath holding, then it kind of gets everything woken up. And here you're just kind of focused on a visual impression of a little light down below your navel just bright and clear and, you know, kind of then radiating out and it can just clear the cobwebs and it's really useful. So it's done, you know, after you've done this breathing practice to help with the wandering mind, if the mind is still dull and not just wandering, add some light. So what do you think of these antidotes? Do you prefer mental antidotes? You know, if you're um, scattered and attached, remember death, right? <laughs> if you're feeling sad and heavy, remember all the good things, your perfect human rebirth lifted up, you know? So there's mental antidotes for um, the mind scattering and the mind getting heavy, but these are more physical antidotes. Of course, they use the mind, but they're more physical. Um, what do you think? I prefer mental. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I do generally too. Um, you know, I find that I do the physical ones more likely if I'm actually a little bit sick, you know, like if I'm having a cold or I'm a bit like low energy or something then I, I, I kind of use more physical antidotes if physicality is part of my obstacle just personally in my own practice. I think really it's a, it's a question of preference. Yeah. So if you know lots of things you could do, then you might just choose one or two that work for you. But now you know a few more techniques. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, my mind was stolen by your snot uh, surrounding. The surrounding? Oh yeah, it's beautiful. My mind was stolen by the, <laughs> the go outside in your snot is there. I'm just in human spirits. Ah. And I don't, I'm outside because inside I, is, there's no internet. Like the internet is awful. <laughs> well, that's very sweet. <laughs> You're back at class. Um, so, you know, when, when your mind is distracted, there's, there's a million reasons why, aren't there? And sometimes it's worth asking yourself, why am I distracted? Sometimes don't ask yourself why, just address it. You know, it's, it's with so many of these things, it's having the flexibility and the self-awareness to know, today, I can guess why I'm distracted. I don't need to go there. I'm just going to stir up my mind. Let's just apply an antidote. And then some days you're like, what is eating me? What is the problem? All right, let's just sit and deal with what's stressing me out before I try to meditate, because otherwise the whole meditation is going to be a battle. 
you know, so it's just having that flexibility of mind to know which techniques when and to know how to do them well enough that if you want them, they're there. And if you don't want them, no worries. But um, if you want them now, they're accessible to you. It, it's also useful because I know that um, uh, it's likely that one or two of you might wind up being in some sort of leadership role and leading others in meditation somewhere down the track. Whether you're qualified or not, <laughs> um, it might just happen. Um, and so now you know also things to offer other people if they're stuck in ways that you don't get stuck. You might be like, oh, why does that one not work for you? Okay, let's try this technique. So you'll have something you can offer other people if they're trying to meditate and get stuck. So, maybe yeah. you, you Can you send us, uh, or maybe you sent and I missed it, uh, I need, I, I have to uh, feel it and because now we are talking about it, but I, I won't. Um, I mean, we, it's, it's something that if we were all together, you know, in the same room, I would just do it as one of our meditations, but it's sort of weird to record it because it's not like you can see me and hear and so I'll send you nine round breathing. I have a recording of that. But for the, um, the techniques, I think it's easiest if you just read it really slowly and just try and experiment. And then you can ask questions like, okay, when I get to this point, this happens and I don't know what to do. I think it's easier if you just kind of play with it based on Lama Yeshi's description and then write down where you get stuck because you maybe won't know what your questions are until you've experimented. Um, yeah, so if we, if we were all in the same room, we could just do it right now and um, workshop it. But um, I don't think it works online, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, w I was thinking about the difference between them and the mental and the physical. I think that uh, the mental one is easier in a sense that we can relate to it more. But maybe sometimes it stops us because the physical is something more, I don't know, deep, open, um in a sense maybe but yeah i mean it's, it's not it's easy correct yeah. Right. yeah i don't know yeah i don't know it's i think you guys are naturally introspective people that's why you're drawn to the work that you're drawn to you know mm -hmm. so you're introspective people so using introspective antidotes and techniques i think would probably come naturally to you just you know by virtue of this particular group for, for some people, the mental antidotes don't make any sense to them. And it's sort of, they're like, what do you mean? Look at my anger. What does that have to do with why I can't watch my breath? And you're like, okay, that's another story for another time. Let's just try this. <laughs> and it works. You know, um, when I teach meditation to little kids, I very much focus it on the physical and not so much on the mental. So like the sound of the bell, um, I'll say, okay, listen really hard until you can't hear it anymore. And that helps them get into a concentrated mindset. But for them, it's like a physical experience of how good are my ears? I'm going to listen and listen and listen and listen. And then I ask them to like raise their hand when they can't hear it anymore. And um, it helps them, you know, engage with focus. And then, um, and then once they've listened to the bell and they can't hear it anymore, I say, okay, so how long can you keep the memory of the sound of the bell before you get distracted? And when you get distracted, raise your hand, you know, so it's, it's very related to their physical experience, but it's helping them tie into the mentality that I'm trying to get them used to, you know, so sometimes physical stuff works um, for people that are less analytical or less used to analysis. And you guys are very used to analysis. So <laughs> using analytical antidotes works just fine. Uh, but yeah, no, and I wouldn't teach this completely to kids, but the nine round breathing, it, you could teach to kids a little bit. You know, let's do left, let's do right. Who can't remember their left and their right? That's okay. These are the only two Hebrew words I know. It's because of ways. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, see what works, but uh, it's, it's just something else to pop in your tool belt. Um, then let me ask you. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just thought that when I get sleepy, there's nothing I can do about it. I really, I think, I feel like I'm helpless against it. And sometimes it's totally unconnected to my physical state. And I just constantly get sleep. I don't know what to do with it. What would you say to a patient who says the same thing on the, on the couch? 
<laughs> that I wasn't tired before I got here, but now that we're going through this, I just can't stop myself from sleeping. What would you say to them? Yeah, well, I, I, I figure that some of our teachers, I get more sleepy and I feel quite helpless about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, it's something that you wanna be really friendly with yourself about because if you're too pressurized with your antidotes, it'll trigger like an inner rebellion and it'll become just the pattern. So if you can kind of, um, in a way, push pause on the meditation and just do something to refresh yourself, like, okay, air, light. Let's look at the light. Let's think about air. Let's open my eyes um, and not try to meditate for a whole minute. You know, I'm just going to listen as if I'm listening to a lecture rather than listen with the idea of trying to meditate. So you can listen and just think, I'm learning how to do the meditation that I will do later when I'm by myself. Because right now, their word choices or their pacing or the topic is not the right resonance for me. And I can't quite synchronize. So you don't have to feel bad about it. Just kind of like listen to the words as training to do the meditation later. And then maybe sometimes if it's a whole sea of words, think, okay, what was the main word there? The main word there was mindfulness or the main word was motivation or you know and you just try and like make an, a mental exercise for yourself rather than feeling like you have to meditate if you're just having too many obstacles so that's one way you know the other way is to ask yourself is this just a very natural resistance to the content is there something deep about this content that i'm feeling really reactive towards and my mind is shutting down because it does not want to look at it right now Sometimes it's topic related and sometimes it's presenter related. It, you know, can be related to so many things, but you know that it's at the end of the day about you. So why, why this, why now? That question, if you have space for it, why this, why now? Because of course, if it is just raw physical tiredness, then don't worry about it. Have a sleep, try again later. Don't overthink it, you know, but if it's, it's something that keeps happening, whether you're actually tired or not, it could be some resistance to self-awareness, some fear of what you'll find. It could be the ego fearing its destruction. And then that's fantastic news. Um, a lot of people have a certain topic that they always vague out whenever it comes up. Even if moments before they were sharp and clear, and as soon as the topic moves on, they're sharp and clear. That particular topic, they just zone out and they're just like out to sea. You know, that, that happens to a lot of people. It happens to me sometimes. Um, and it's like, okay, that topic, I obviously have less karmic affinity with or less relationship with, or it's very confronting, one of the two. That's just something to know rather than feel, I don't know, bad about, just something to know. But but it does happen to you guys, doesn't it? Where the, um, where the patient falls asleep when certain topics come up or they fall asleep. Doesn't that happen? I don't know. I've heard stories. And then you just kind of let them, right? <laughs> and then ask them what they're dreaming about. I don't know. And maybe they're just tired. <laughs> and they're like, whew, that was a rough yeah, day. What, what, do you do when, <laughs> what do you do when it's a whole semester? <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Um, you think planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds. <laughs> They'll, sprout <Okay>. later. <laughs> They'll sprout later. Um, or you can think I'm building relationships and I'm building familiarity. And even if I have no idea what's going on the whole time, at least I've made friends. <laughs> you, know, you already were friends, but you know, you're making deeper friendships and deeper connections and you know. It happens. The very first topic of the advanced study program that I did when I became a nun was tenants, which is the, the four philosophical schools approach to emptiness. And I hadn't really studied emptiness that much itself. And I went straight into the advanced one because it's not like university where you start at the beginning. You just start wherever they're up to. So they were like halfway through a seven year course and I just started. And, you know, I dropped out of high school. I never went to university. I was a baker, you know, and I was just sitting there like, what is going on? Like, what? You know, and uh, I was completely out to sea. But I learned how to study, even though the content of that semester, gone. 
but I learned how my own mind approaches new content and I learned what I need to do and what I need to not do. And I just got a little bit of discipline and then the next semester was a lot easier. And then eventually that topic came back around and then I did it again and it made more sense. And, you know, we're not done until the path of no more learning anyway, which is Buddhahood. So, you know, we'll always be a student. We don't need to feel finished, you know, or feel bad about being unfinished, I guess, more accurately. Just do it again. Yeah, if you like it, you know, and if you don't like it, you're like, well, anyway, that was something to know. Moving on. <laughs> Right. So um, it, it's interesting to teach you guys because um, normally I teach people who are Buddhist, right? And a few people who are curious about Buddhism, but they're already like in, you know, they're invested. This is their life. This is their path. And so there's a whole level of resistance that they've already kind of moved through before I even meet them. And um, we always say you don't have to be Buddhist to practice Buddhism. And you can practice Buddhism just the bits that work for you. You don't have to practice the whole thing. We always say that, but it's actually very rare to meet people who are actually doing that. I'll just take the bits that are useful and I'll leave the rest behind. I don't, don't meet people like that very often, just in my normal life. So um, I'm learning as much as you're learning what's the right way to approach things with people who this isn't necessarily their whole life like it is for me. You know, so I'm learning too. And we just slowly, slowly and uh, keep your sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> or um, what does uh, Suzuki Roshi say? What we're doing is very important, so we better not take it too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> this. Yeah. Okay, so um, any, any Lamayashi questions? Um, those two? He, um, he goes on to describe basically, in a nutshell, when this kind of thought arises, here's how to think about it. When this kind of thought arises, this is how to think about it. And the summary of all of it is try not to invest. Yeah. That the main discipline, whether you're Buddhist or not, whether you're taking on the whole path or not, if you're trying to learn how to meditate and develop the mind, the discipline we all need is the discipline that says not all thoughts are worth following. <laughs> Not all feelings are important. Yeah, and in this short, contained period of time, if I've decided to do this one thing, it gives me power to keep coming back to the one thing. And I lose power if I say, eh, too hard, I'm going off with the fairies. You know, so then you feel like meditation doesn't work, having never actually tried. You know, you would never say to someone who exercised once, well, if you exercised once and you're not healthier, then obviously exercise is not for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're going to need to try it for a while until you find your right pace and you find your right technique. And then you'll see over time, you'll get healthier. Um, you know, the same is true for meditation that, you know, you have to try a lot of different gyms you know, <laughs> before you find your gym, your, your Dharma gym that is the right fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, how do you visualize the light uh, in the, um, below your navel? How do you visualize it? You could picture like a, a flashlight, you know, a flashlight turned on, like a little circle of light uh, um, that's very bright, and you just place it down there, um, and it's in your mind's eye, you know, so it doesn't have to appear like a hologram out in front. It's, it's like a memory of a time you've seen a circle of light. You bring that memory of light down to that spot. Yeah. Yeah, and just hold it a little bit, you know, without any kind of pressure. Yeah, without any kind of pressure, but with some steadiness and clarity. So when you're remembering that the main, the main training is to break the association between focus and stress, you can be focused without stress. And the main training is to break the association between sleep and relaxation. You can be relaxed without being sleepy. So, you know, that, that combination, that like sweet spot, that razor's edge of being bright, clear, focused, and completely relaxed, that's the mind that we're trying to bring to any meditation, whether it's single pointed or it's analytical, whatever it is, because that kind of focus being in the zone is making everything that we've learned in our life accessible in our daily life. 
You know, so if you have a very powerful focused mind, then when you're walking around and talking to people and doing your work, you're, you're able to access your learning. You know, your technical learning, your life experience learning, all of your learning is at your fingertips when you're focused. And when you're distracted, only a couple of things are available. You know, so it might still work and it might be good enough, but it's like all of your resources aren't as available to you when you're distracted as they are when you're focused. So just, you know, very gently just trying to cultivate that skill that stays in steadiness and relaxation, even if you get confused during the meditation. You can be steady and relaxed with, I'm not totally sure what the instruction just was, but let's just try and stay focused and clear. If I'm not totally sure what the object is, I'll just use the breath until I hear the next instruction that makes sense. Because the main thing is staying relaxed with focus. You know, so try not to bring any tension to confusion. You can just be like, oh, confusion. Yep, coming back. You know, just like, oh, there's the sound of construction. Coming back. Sound of a dog barking. Coming back. I missed the point of that. Anyway, coming back. You know, and you just keep that coming back attitude just really gently. Yeah. And it's, it's very important for, the, for a therapist, this uh, this way of uh, being yep. to be focused to 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 listen to not to get swept away in your your thoughts or or feelings about it to feel but not not to get swept away or sunk exactly Think. yeah exactly so you're you're in a good position you know, because your work can reinforce your meditation and your meditation can reinforce your work and it, it works together really beautifully. So, it's cool stuff. Well done, team. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll just take a minute and um, dedicate. Thinking all of this energy goes towards positive development so that we can be of benefit to both ourselves and others. Thanks, guys.